Chapter Nine of This Crowded Earth by Robert Bloch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Greg Marguerite. This Crowded Earth by Robert Bloch. Chapter Nine. Eric Donovan, 2031. Eric was glad to get to the office and shut the door. Lately he'd had this feeling whenever he went out, this feeling that people were staring at him. It wasn't just his imagination. They did stare. Every younger person over a yard high got stared at nowadays as if they were freaks. And it wasn't just the staring that got him down, either. Sometimes they muttered and mumbled, and sometimes they called names. Eric didn't mind stuff like Dirty Naturalist. That he could understand. Once upon a time, way back, everybody who was against the left law was called a naturalist. And before that it had still another meaning, or so he'd been told. Today, of course, it just meant anyone who was over five feet tall. No, he could take the ordinary name-calling all right, but sometimes they said other things. They used words nobody ever uses unless they really hate you and want to kill you. And that was at the bottom of it, Eric knew. They did hate him. They did want to kill him. Was he a coward? Perhaps. But it wasn't just Eric's imagination. You never saw anything about such things on the telescreens, but naturalists were being killed every day. The older people were still in the majority, but the youngsters were coming up fast, and there were so many more of them. Besides, they were more active, and this created the illusion that there were yardsticks everywhere. Eric sat down behind his desk, grinning. Yardsticks. When he was a kid, it had been just the other way around. He and the rest of them who didn't get shots in those early days considered themselves to be the normal ones, and they did the name-calling. Names like Runt and Half-Pint and Midgey. But the most common name was the one that stuck, Yardstick. That used to be the worst insult of all. But now it wasn't an insult any more. Being taller was the insult. Being a dirty naturalist or a son of a naturalist. Times certainly had changed. Eric glanced at the communicator. Almost noon, and it had not flicked yet. There he'd been, beaming these big offers. You'd think he'd get some response to an expensive beaming program, but no. Maybe that was the trouble. Nobody liked big things any more. Everything was small. He shifted uneasily in his chair. That was one consolation, at least. He still had old-time furniture, getting to be harder and harder to find stuff that fitted him these days. Seemed like most of the firms making furniture and bedding and household appliances were turning out the small stuff for the younger generation. Cheaper to make, less material, and more demand for it. Government allocated size priorities to the manufacturers. It was even murder to ride public transportation because of the space reductions. Eric drove his own jetter. Besides, that way was safer. Crowded into a liner with a gang of yardsticks with only a few other naturalists around, there might be trouble. Oh, it was getting to be a yardstick world, and no mistake. Smaller furniture, smaller meals, smaller sizes and clothing, smaller buildings. That reminded Eric of something, and he frowned again. Damn it! Why didn't the communicator flick? He should be getting some kind of inquiries. Hell, he was practically giving the space away. But there was only silence, as there had been all during this past week. That's why he let Lorette go. Sweet girl, but there was no work for her here any more. No work and no pay, either. Besides, the place spooked her. She'd been the one who suggested leaving, really. Eric, I'm sorry, but I just can't take this any more. All alone in this huge building, it's curling my toes. At first he tried to talk her out of it. Don't be silly, Luscious. There's Bernstein down on ten, and Saltonstall above us, and Wallaby and Son on fourteen. I tell you this place is coming back to life. I can feel it. I'll beam for tenants next week. You'll see. Actually, he'd been talking against his own fear, and Lorette must have known it. Anyway, she left, and now he was here, alone. Alone. Eric didn't like the sound of that word, or the absence of sound behind it. Three other tenants in a ninety-story building. Three other tenants in a place that had once held three thousand. Why, fifty years ago, when this place went up, you couldn't buy a vacancy. Where had the crowds gone to? He knew the answer, of course. The left shots had created the new generation of yardsticks, and they lived in their own world, their shrunken, dehydrated world of dollhouses and miniatures. They deserted the old-fashioned skyscrapers and cut the big apartment buildings up into tiny cubicles. Two could occupy the space formerly reserved for one. That had been the purpose of the left shots in the first place, to put an end to overcrowding and conserve on resources. Well, it had worked out. Worked out too perfectly for people like Eric Donovan. 
Eric Donovan, rental agent for a building nobody wanted any more, a ninety-story mausoleum, and nobody could collect rent from ghosts. Ghosts. Eric damn near jumped through the ceiling when the door opened and this man walked in. He was tall and tow-headed. Eric stared. There was something vaguely familiar about his face. Something about those ears. That was it, those ears. No, it couldn't be. It wasn't possible. Eric stood up and held out his hand. I'm Donovan, he said. The tow-headed man smiled and nodded. Yes, I know. Don't you remember me? I thought I knew you from some place. You wouldn't be Sam Walzik. The tow-headed man's smile became a broad grin. That's not what you were going to say, Eric. You were going to say, Handlehead, weren't you? Well, go on, say it. I don't mind. I've been called a lot worse things since we were kids together. I can't believe it, Eric murmured. It's really you, old Handlehead Walzik. And after all these years turning up to rent an office from me, well, what do you know? I didn't come here to rent an office. Oh? Then? It was your name that brought me. I recognized it on the beamings. This is a social call, eh? Well, that's good. I don't get much company these days. Sit down and have a reef. Walzak sat down, but refused the smoke. I know quite a bit about your setup, he said. You and your three tenants. It's tough, Eric. Oh, things could be worse, Eric forced a laugh. It isn't as if my bucks depended on the number of tenants in the building. Government subsidizes this place. I'm sure of a job as long as I live. As long as you live, Walzak stared at him in a way he didn't like. And just how long do you figure that to be? I'm only twenty-six, Eric answered. According to statistics, that gives me maybe another sixty years. Statistics. Walzak said it like a dirty word. Your life expectancy isn't determined by statistics any more. I say you don't have sixty months left, perhaps not even sixty days. What are you trying to hand me? The truth. And don't go looking for a silver platter underneath it, either. But I mind my own business. I don't hurt anybody. Why should I be in any danger? Why does a government subsidy support one rental manager to sit here in this building every day, but ten guards to patrol it every night? Eric opened his mouth wide before shaping it for speech. Who told you that? Like I said, I know the setup. Walzak crossed his legs, but he didn't lean back. And in case you haven't guessed it, this is a business call, not a social one. Eric sighed. Might have figured, he said. You're a naturalist, aren't you? Of course I am. We all are. Not I. Oh, yes. Whether you like it or not, you're a naturalist, too. As far as the yardsticks are concerned, everyone over three feet high is a naturalist, an enemy, someone to be hated and destroyed. Think I'd believe that? Sure. I know they don't like us. And why should they? We eat twice as much, we take up twice the space, and I guess when we were kids we gave a lot of them a hard time. Besides, outside of a few exceptions like ourselves, all the younger generation are yardsticks, with more coming every year. The older people hold the key positions in the power. Of course, there's a lot of friction and resentment, but you know all that. Certainly, Walzik nodded. All that and more. Much more. I know that up until a few years ago, no yardstick held any public office or government position. Now they're starting to move in, particularly in Europe-Asia. But there's so many of them now, adults in their early twenties, that the pressure is building up. They're impatient, getting out of hand. They won't wait until the old folks die off. They want control now. And if they ever manage to get it, we're finished for good. Impossible, Eric said. Impossible? Wolzik's voice was a mocking echo. You sit there in this tomb, and when somebody tells you that the world you know has died, you refuse to believe it. Even though every night after you sneak home and huddle up inside your room trying not to be noticed, ten guards patrol this place with subatomics so the yardstick gangs won't break in and take over. So they won't do what they did down south, overrun the office buildings and the factories and break them up, cut them down to size for living quarters. But they were stopped, Eric objected. I saw it on the telescreen. The security forces stopped them. Crapola! Walzak pronounced the archaicism with studied care. You saw films, faked films. Have you ever traveled, Eric, been down south and seen conditions there? Nobody travels nowadays. You know that. Priorities. I travel, Eric, and I know. Security forces don't suppress anything in the south these days, because they're made up of yardsticks now. That's right, yardsticks exclusively. And in a few years, that's the way it will be up here. Did you ever hear about the Chicago riots? You mean last year when the yardsticks tried to take over the synthetic plants at the stockyards? tried, they succeeded. 
The workers ousted management. Over fifty thousand were killed in the revolution. Oh, don't look so shocked. That's the right word for it. But the yardsticks won out in the end. But the telescreens showed... Damn the telescreens! I know, because I happened to be there when it happened. And if you had been there, you and a few million other ostriches who sit with your heads buried in telescreens, maybe we could have stopped them. I don't believe it. I can't. All right. Think back. That was last year. And since the first of this year, what's happened to the standard size meat ration? They cut it in half, Eric admitted, but that's because of ag shortages, according to the telescreen reports. He stood up, gulping. Look here, I'm not going to listen to any more of this kind of talk. By rights I ought to turn your name in. Go ahead, Walzak waved his hand. It's happened before. I was reported when I blasted the yardsticks who shot my father down when he tried to land his jet in a southern field. I was reported when they killed Annette. Annette? You remember that name, don't you, Eric? Your first girl, wasn't she? Well, I'm the guy who married her. Yes, and I'm the guy who talked her into having a baby without the benefit of left shots. Sure, it's illegal, and only a few of us ever try it any more, but we both agreed that we wanted it that way. A real life-sized normal baby. Or abnormal, according to the yardsticks and the stupid government. It was a dirty scum of a government doctor who let her die on the table when he discovered the child weighed seven pounds. That's when I really woke up, Eric. That's when I knew there was going to be only one decision to make in the future. Kill or be killed. Annette, she died, you say?" Walzak moved over and put his hand on Eric's shoulder. You never married her, did you, Eric? I think I know why. It's because you felt the way I did about it. You wanted a regular kid, not a yardstick. Only you didn't quite have the guts to try and beat the law. Well, you'll need guts now, because it's getting to the point where the law can't protect you any more. The government is made up of old men, and they're afraid to take action. In a few years they'll be pushed out of office all over the world. We'll have yardstick government, then, all the way and yardstick law. And that means they'll cut us down to size. But what can you, we, do about it? Plenty. There's still a little time if we naturalists can only get together, stop being just a name and become an organized force. Maybe the ending will be different. We've got to try, in any case. The yardsticks are human beings, just like us, Eric said slowly. We can't just declare war on them, wipe them out. It's not their fault. They were born that way. Walzak nodded. I know. Nothing is anybody's fault, really. This whole business began in good faith. Leffingwell and some of the other geniuses saw a problem and offered what they sincerely believed was a solution. But it didn't work, Eric murmured. Wrong. It worked only too well. That's the trouble. Sure, we eliminated our difficulties on the physical level. In less than thirty years we've reached a point where there's no longer any danger of overcrowding or starvation. But the psychological factor is something we can't cope with. We thought we'd ended war and the possibilities of war a long time ago, but it isn't foreign enemies we must fear today. We've created a nation divided into Davids and Goliaths, and David and Goliath are always enemies. David killed Goliath, Eric said. Does that mean we're going to die? Only if we're as stupid as Goliath was, only if we wear our telescreens like invisible armor and pay no attention to the slingshots in David's hands. Eric lit a reef. All right, he said. You don't have to lecture. I'm willing to join. But I'm no Goliath. Really, I never had a fight in my life. What could I do to help? You're a rental agent. You have the keys to this building. The guards don't bother you by day, do they? You come and go as you please. That means you can get into the cellars. You can help us move the stuff down there. And we'll take care of the guards some night after that. I don't understand. The friendly pressure on Eric's shoulder became a fierce grip. You don't have to understand. All you do is let us plant the stuff in the cellars and let us get rid of the guards afterwards in our own way. The yardsticks will do the rest. You mean take over the building when it's not protected? Of course. They'll take it over completely, once they see there's no opposition, and they'll remodel it to suit themselves, and within a month there'll be ten thousand yardsticks sitting in this place. The government will never stand still for that. Wake up. It's happening all over, all the time, and nothing is being done to prevent it. Security is too weak, and officials are too timid to risk open warfare. So the yardsticks win. And I'm going to see that they win this place. But how will that help us? You don't see it yet, do you? 
and neither will the yardsticks, until some fine day three or four months from now when we get around to what will be planted in the cellars. Somebody will throw a switch miles away and... Boom. Walzak, you couldn't. It's coming. Not only here, but in fifty other places. We've got to fight fire with fire, Eric. It's our only chance. Bring this thing out into the open. Make the government realize this is war. Civil war. That's the only way to force them to take real action. We can't do it any other way. It's illegal to organize politically, and petitions do no good. We can't get a hearing. Well, they'll have to listen to the explosions. I just don't know. Maybe you're the one who should have married Annette, after all. Walzak's voice was cold. Maybe you could have watched her, watched her scream and beg and die, and never wanted to move a muscle to do anything about it afterwards. Maybe you're the model citizen, Eric, you and the thousands of others who are standing by and letting the yardsticks chop us down one by one. They say in nature it's survival of the fittest. Well, perhaps you're not fit to survive. Eric wasn't listening. She screamed, he said. You heard her scream? Walzek nodded. I can still hear her. I'll always hear her. Eric blinked abruptly. When do we start? Walzak smiled at him. It was a pretty good smile for a man who can always hear screaming. I knew I could count on you, he murmured. Nothing like old friends. Funny, isn't it? Eric tried to match his smile. The way things work out. You and I being kids together, you marrying my girl, and then us meeting up again this way. Yes, said Walzak, and he wasn't smiling now. I guess it's a small world. End of chapter 9 of This Crowded Earth by Robert Bloch